Welcome everyone to the first uh, ASA 2021 Student and Early Career Panel. This is co-sponsored by the American Scientific Affiliation and InterVarsity's Emerging Scholars Network, uh, which is our department that supports folks on the academic pathway from considering grad school through becoming professors or taking those skills somewhere else to serve God in another setting. We're really delighted that you're here today. And as we were thinking about the ASA conference this year and the, uh, the different subtitles of the theme, we were thinking of that idea of the gift of scientia, the gift of study, the gift of learning, the gift of science. And we thought a wonderful example of that is the gift of vaccine development and delivery uh, as we've seen this remarkable process of developing a COVID-19 vaccine quickly. And we thought it would be wonderful to give you little glimpses of people who've done different work along the way that's made that possible or helped to do follow-up study of how that vaccine works or helped in actually delivering it. Now, obviously that's a huge process. We couldn't feature someone at every step, but we have a wonderful panel of three people who can share some of their professional and scientific insights and expertise at various steps of understanding COVID-19 and responding with treatment for the common good. So well, we're delighted to feature Patricia fitzgerald Bukarsley, who is a provost in the Rutgers Health Sciences School and also an immunologist. And she'll describe some of her scientific background and work in understanding COVID-19. And then Kelly Seaton, who does HIV vaccine research at Duke and is also working on understanding how the COVID-19 vaccines work. And then E. Janet Warren, who is a past president of the Canadian Scientific and Christian Affiliation and a family physician and has been part of delivering vaccines in Canada and also has a PhD in theology. So they bring a rich range of experience and insight and we're really delighted to have them. Uh, so I know Pat will start us off and she has a presentation. Okay, so um, I came bearing slides. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and I haven't been doing vaccine development but I teach vaccines to medical students and graduate students and we support the vaccine, some of the vaccine work being done at Rutgers. So, um, so my career, which is very long at this point, um, has been bookended by two different pandemics. And my um, daughter-in-law, who is an artist, did this lovely drawing for me. So at the very beginning of my career, when I was uh, just starting my postdoc at Sun Kettering in New York City, we saw some of the very earliest uh, patients in it, that were um, coming down with this strange immunodeficiency, um, which we of course now know as HIV. So along the way, we've studied natural killer cells, interferon alpha, defined the cells, first to define the cells that make the interferon alpha. Um, more recently, we've been studying immune senescence and immune activation um, and CDA T cells. So we were well poised with all of these studies to be able to jump in very quickly um, when the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic uh, started. So, so, so for me as a viral immunologist, it's been fascinating to have these two uh, pandemics bookending my career. And my career isn't ending. Um, I figure there's still room for this bookend to move out a bit. So it was in the fall of 1980, in the winter of 81, where I was a brand new, freshly minted uh, PhD. I saw some of the first cases of what would later be known as, as AIDS. Um, and then in the summer of 1985, I started my independent career at NJMS, New Jersey Medical School, studying natural killer cells and interferon production at the cellular level as applied to HIV patients um, and the basic biology. But we've always had to um, discover the basic biology of the cells we study um, and then apply it to our patient studies. And we we carried out um, a bunch of different kinds of studies over the years. Um, and most recently, we've been studying immune dysregulation in HIV infection and in aging. 
and premature aging of the immune system. And then I started collaborating uh, with a senescence person here and started studying CD8 T cell senescence. So along the way, I was tenured and promoted to associate and full professor, um, had three kids, which um, are, are all grown, and two of them are scientists, um, one a faculty member and one a postdoc, and then became director of a flow cytometry core facility, which is one of my specialties and vice chair. And then in 2018, I was appointed provost of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences, which is a half-time job, allegedly. So I still have my research lab. So in the winter of 2020, um, we, we all, uh, it seems like a long time ago now, but when SARS-CoV-2 um, hit, the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area was hit extremely hard. Um, as you know, an epicenter of the, of the disease. Um, our hospital here in Newark was deluged with cases and we had as many as 10 people dying overnight um, on some nights. It was just terrifying. Um, dental teaching labs were converted into patient units. Um, we were just, people were everywhere. Um, there were shortages as everyone members of PPE, and we had body trucks in the parking lot because the morgue could not hold all the people who were dying. So it was a terrifying time. Um, Rutgers almost immediately established the Center for COVID Response and Pandemic Preparedness to do both basic and clinical research, including animal models, human studies, vaccine and testing development. Um, there were collaborations between scientists, clinicians, um, bioinformaticians, uh, ethicists, and social scientists. And so it was a really massive effort at Rutgers. And then, of course, we had all of our outside collaborations as well. Research at Rutgers stopped in March of 2020, but the labs doing COVID research were allowed to keep open. And since, I, since we were viral immunologists, we could not, we could not continue our HIV studies because those clinics were closed down but we pivoted very rapidly to studying COVID-19. So we had um, funding from our internal CCRP and we got a couple of NIH um, grants that were supplements to our other funding. And we were testing the hypothesis that one of the reasons that SARS-CoV-2 was especially devastating in older individuals was that the immune system was already experiencing profound senescence um, leading to the inability to respond properly. So we studied um, our uh, canonical PDCs, the dendritic cells and T cell responses in patients that were admitted to the hospital as well as in convalescent and later vaccinated individuals. So we've been uh, looking at this um, all across the spectrum and we're still now, I guess we're getting a new wave of patients and we're starting to look at some of those people. Um, we interacted along the way with those doing vaccine trials. Moderna and J&J &J were both active at our campus and studied patients who were infected and versus healthy and those who were infected in the hospital despite vaccination um, or that have been coming up this year. So we're looking to see how those individuals look that are still ending up in the hospital. So I just want to point out that eight out of 10 of COVID-19 deaths reported in the U.S., we're in adults 65 years and older, and older adults and people with underlying health conditions were at much higher risk of developing severe forms of COVID. Um, and if you look at um, in the, this red uh, triangle here, um, in the one on the left, that um, it was the people with um, older people represent only 16% of the population but 80% of the cases. So, and I won't go into a lot of detail here, but we, did, we do complex flow cytometry to measure the numbers of cells that people have per microliter of blood of specific types, as well as the percent of those as part of the white blood cells that circulate. So um, what you can see here is the green are healthy donors and the orange and yellow are COVID patients either treated with dexamethasone in yellow or not treated in orange. And purple were individuals who were convalescent by about two months. So what we see are 
dramatic decreases in T cells, both CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells, not so big of changes in B cells. And um, we also observed that they had significantly higher levels of a senescent cell marker um, called beta-galactosidase activities. And so the normal donors are in green and we see a significantly increased amount of these beta-gal high cells, which are telling us that they do have more senescence associated markers versus age match controls. And we saw the same thing in CD4 and CD8 T cells. Um, my other, my, my favorite cell that I was, our lab was among those who discovered the cell now more than 20 years ago, um, PDCs. Um, so they have a, dramatic loss of PDCs as an absolute number per microliter of blood, um, even more, more pronounced in patients receiving the immunosuppressive dexamethasone, but even in individuals not on dexamethasone. But it recovers, uh, the levels do recover um, after recovery from COVID. In addition to having fewer of the cells, the cells that are there are dysfunctional. So this is showing you interferon alpha production in response to both herpes simplex virus or flu virus on the right. And what we see is, is that they're functionally deficient. So they're both numerically and functionally deficient. So just to conclude what we've been learning about our science is, is that when we look across the spectrum of, of healthy individuals, we see an increase with aging and we start actually with cord blood from newborns who have very few senescent cells um, up until individuals in their 80s, and we've even had a couple donors in their 90s, we see an accumulation of these senescent cells. And in the scenario of, um, of SARS-CoV-2, we believe that this the senescent phenotype in cells that are not as functional are leading to this um, severe increase in SARS-CoV-2 susceptibility. So, if we look at where we are right now, this is, I pulled this off just this morning from the New York Times site. And, and this is a, a pandemic as it's played out in the United States. What we see here is the first wave uh, in 2020, early, um, and then last summer when we thought things were going pretty well. And then the huge peak, the third wave that occurred over the winter a little bit of a blip in April, but look what's happening now. What we're seeing is a dramatic increase in the numbers of COVID cases. Um, and and um, this is reaching high levels that are higher than we saw in what we considered the worst of the pandemic. So this is happening despite the fact that up to 90% or 90 percent of people 65 and up have been vaccinated, um, either partially or 80% uh, or fully or partially for 80% or um, it goes the other way around, sorry. Um, and all ages, we see that about half of Americans are fully vaccinated um, and 57% have had at least one dose. This increase in cases is happening in all 50 states, but is particularly bad in areas with the lowest vaccination rates. So it's uh, there's a big push, as everyone knows now, to get people vaccinated um, to try and depoliticize the whole situation. So where are we today? Um, again, all states are showing dramatic increases in COVID-19 cases, and this is happening around the world as well. The new variant that is taking over or has taken over in New Jersey, it's 100% at this point, the Delta variant is at least two times more infectious and the viral loads are more than a thousand times higher in the upper airway than previous strain. Um, an internal CDC memo yesterday indicates that Delta is as infectious as chickenpox, which most of the, your, your younger um, watchers are not, had, were all vaccinated, but it used to be that you would get chickenpox and it would just spread like wildfire in whatever that community um, almost all hospitalization, hospitalizations and deaths now are occurring in unvaccinated people. So the vaccines are quite effective um, and especially the mRNA vaccines are known to be highly effective, but it's also known that vaccinated people can be infected. They may not get sick, but they can, it has been now shown, pass on the virus, but usually don't get seriously ill. 
And our preliminary data in a cohort of older African Americans that are more than 65 years of age, um, we've studied about 30 of these so far, show that, um, that most responded extremely well to the mRNA vaccines, even much higher than I would have expected, and even better than some of our younger donors. Um, um, but three of the 20 had low, of the first 20 we studied, had low to no antibody response, which is concerning in these older people, including a 91-year-old woman who had no detectable antibody whatsoever. So, you know, that's a pretty high percentage that could potentially be of risk. So I'm going to stop there. Pat, thank you so much. It's really helpful to hear about some of the science work you've been doing just to understand how the disease functions and how we can treat it. And really helpful to have a brief summary of where we're at now and makes me even more deeply grateful for the work that's gone into vaccine development. And now we're going to hear from Kelly Seaton about some of the specific work that she's done in understanding how the vaccine works. So over to you, Kelly. Hey everyone, um, I'm Kelly. I am a project manager, laboratory manager at the Duke Center for Human Systems Immunology. And we study vaccine responses to infectious diseases, which is why I'm part of this panel. Um, I have been at Duke uh, for 11 years. I started out as a postdoc in the same lab that I'm in, um, and we study um, kind of the complement to what Pat just spoke about. We study antibody responses or B cells um, in vaccination and infection. Um, so um, in the past year, um, we transitioned. I mostly, my first kind of passion or love is HIV vaccines, um, and then COVID hit and we transitioned quickly as um, similar to what Pat mentioned, we had to kind of halt a lot of our ongoing research and, and we switched very quickly. Um, I think one of the things in reflecting about, as you know, Hannah asked about the gift of vaccine development is just seeing how all of the work that we've done in the past few years really pivot, you know, transitioned us well into to going towards SARS-CoV-2. Um, there's just a lot of overlap in a lot of the strides that have been made in uh, understanding just the immune response in general, but also getting ready for clinical trial work um, and, and, and all of that. Um, so what our lab does is we measure the antibody responses, both the levels and the function of antibodies that uh, result from infection or vaccination. Um, and then we help companies or product developers understand how to make their vaccines um, more immunogenic, um, more effective or have increased durability, so last longer. Um, and we, we're really looking at immune uh, antibody correlates of protection. Um, and so it's been really exciting, you know, in thinking we don't have an HIV, a successful HIV vaccine yet, but in looking at COVID, a lot of the building blocks we put in place from trying to understand how to get an HIV vaccine really set us up well for the success of the COVID vaccine. Um, and I think it was also neat to see kind of the whole world come together. Um, and, you know, a lot of the barriers um, that have traditionally been in place for vaccine development, so funding, um, enrolling clinical trial volunteers, uh, the, the pipeline in terms of um, the length of time to get regulatory uh, documents approved and things was really just compressed. Um, I remember sitting in a meeting with the Gates Foundation where um, one of the project officers said, you know, I think we should, after the pandemic, we should have the whole world tackle one disease at a time. Um, and then we just, we'd, you know, we'd start eliminating diseases one after um, the other. This was right after, you know, the vaccine came out for SARS-CoV, the vaccines came out for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, you know, I think the, the amount of collaboration and just speed that people uh, put in has been exciting, uh, exciting to see. Um, I think we were all extremely happy with how effective the vaccines were. And, you know, we've been studying mRNA vaccines for a long time. It's just, there haven't been diseases where there was enough um, volunteers enrolling in the trials or um, just that momentum behind it to get it approved. And I think the the vaccines are easier to make. Um, you know, they're they're faster to, to manufacture in, in some aspects and things like that. So it's been really exciting to see how um, this will help us going forward with some of the other things uh, we've been trying to tackle for for a while. So just a quick summary of um, what we're doing. I'm happy to talk more about it in the question and answer time too. 
Thank you so much, Kelly. It's very encouraging to hear about how many years of work, sometimes even on different projects, paid off in this one. And so now we'll transition to Janet, who has actually been part of delivering the vaccine. And Janet, we'd love to hear a bit of your perspective. And to listeners, I'd say uh, after Janet, we're going to try and have a little bit of Q&A before we split into small groups. So get your very brief questions ready. Janet, over to you. And I'll try and be brief. So, yeah, fortunate that, uh, you know, I have the education. I've had, I have a flexible schedule because of all my different things I do um, that live in a country that has money and vaccine availability. Um, so, uh, yeah, I had the opportunity uh, when, when I heard the need for helping out at the mass immunizations clinic. And to be honest, my motivations were somewhat selfish. I mean, not only just wanting to get this pandemic over with, but hey, I get to go out on a Saturday night and see people. <laughs> so there was a certainly a fun aspect to it. Um, everyone that was there was excited to be there. Uh, had some couples who came together and they were on a vaccinate. I enjoyed the camaraderie of working in a multidisciplinary uh, clinic discussion with that. I mean, most of the, I, I don't like to, people don't like it when I say this, but, you know, pretty easy, mindless work. Um, <laughs> but we did have some interesting cases come up and, and nuances that we had discussions around. Um, clinics very organized, um, a lot of behind the scenes, you know, developing the computer programs, doing the scheduling of shifts and appointments, and um, then people being sort of herded in one at a time, <laughs> registered. Um, and then, uh, you know, my 30 second giving the needle is only part of this big program. Uh, there was a librarian uh, working regularly who had been redeployed to help distribute the vaccines, which was also kind of amusing. We were mostly giving Pfizer at this particular clinic, which of course has a short shelf life. So towards the end, they would watch in case there were no shows and they would only draw up just enough. So we would all be lining up, you know, and get one needle at a time and go back and say, OK, I'm open. Send me somebody. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, the, the irony, though, is, um, like I said, relatively easy work, especially compared with some of the mental health care work I do. And yet people were so appreciative. Um, and like I said, you know, it's the 30 second uh, jab, you know, the difficult part was figuring out how to open those little band-aids. Um, but anyway, people often do not realize, you know, they, they just see the, the, the needle part of it, right? And they don't realize it's the final step in many ways. Uh, well, not quite the final, because they then had to go where they were watched by paramedics to make sure they didn't have a reaction. Um, but, you know, this, this long, um, Kelly mentioned pipeline, you know, pipeline of development and uh, the research and just, the, yeah, the, the number of uh, work that has gone on behind the scenes that people are often not aware of. And it reflected that, I think that happens a fair bit in our Christian lives as well. I remember particularly as a, a young Christian in, in medical school and, you know, hearing in church about wonderful missionaries and medical missionaries who, you know, were really frontline caring for people and really doing something for the Lord. Um, and it was only sort of later that I became aware that of what, you know, we're discussing here that um, it was doing is only this end point of a long process so I think the same happens when we think about the cultural mandate. And I want to encourage students, you know, what, whatever you're doing, um, there are so many different ways to fulfill the creation mandate. And I think we need to be cautious about idolizing certain aspects of, of our faith expression. Even some people, some scientists will sort of do their work and then they will go and do mission work. Go, no, it's, it's all um, fulfilling what God uh, asks us to do. Um, we made in his image and we have this big responsibility in fulfilling that image and in being co-carers for his creation, remembering that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Um, so we're merely the stewards or managers on his behalf. Um, in ancient kingdoms, stewards ran the country in the absence of a king. Um, stewardship includes how we spend our time, how we care for our bodies and our environment. Uh, it, because again, when we think of stewardship, sometimes we just think of money. 
does include that, but it includes how we choose to, to spend our, you know, employ our gifts and our talents. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Paul's teaching on the body of Christ, different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of working. And in all of them and in everyone, it's the same God at work. So the world's constantly changing. It's meant to. And we're called to shape creation consciously and conscientiously. Um, so with uh, vaccinations, as I mentioned, every little step is important. Those who have ideas, those who develop the technology, those who even just critique, that's still an important role. Um, those who document, those who are involved in behind the scenes administration, um, they're all equally valid ways to uh, use our gifts in Christian service. Thank you so much, Janet. I really love the way that you summed that up. And I hope that this has been a chance for everyone to get at least a little glimpse into how some of those parts of the process work together and, and how they do add up to a gift of God through the work of scientists collaborating. So we probably have time for one or two questions. If you want further theological reflection on the vaccines, I did uh, write, write an article recently in uh, God and Nature comparing salvation and uh, immunization. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, Lynn, I see you have a question. Please go ahead and ask it. Well, I would encourage the truly early career people and students to ask questions, but it's all quiet. Um, I will go ahead. I was wondering if any of you had comments on what might be happening, let's say a year or two from now um, about doing the lessons learned process about taking our experiences and uh, major changes we need to make to the way we prepare for pandemics and so on and so forth. How do you see that unfolding? Do you think you personally might be involved in, in a future much stronger pandemic preparation uh, activities? Well, I can, I can answer that to some extent, and I, I hope I don't have to be involved in another pandemic, but we certainly are, I think, as a, as a scientific community, gearing up to be able to respond much more quickly. Um, for example, we now know that masks are, are useful and we won't go through that, yes, no, maybe. Um, I think that the companies working with mRNA vaccines are able to produce a new vaccine within a couple of days, in, uh, at least start developing it within a couple of days of getting a sequence, which is what happened actually with um, SARS-CoV-2. So um, this was light speed compared to what a normal vaccine development period would be, which is typically more like 10 years. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of things that we've learned, a lot of things that we can do better. Um, my university has, uh, our, our institute is not only to look at the COVID pandemic, but it's also pandemic preparedness. So really to be there. And I think that's happening all over, all over the place. So. Thank you so much. Um, we've only got two minutes of question time yet, uh, but I do see someone has put in the chat a question for Dr. Seaton. Could you comment on the superior effectiveness of the mRNA vaccines in comparison to the ones developed in the more traditional methods like AstraZeneca's and Sinovac? Uh, is there a brief answer to that, Dr. Seaton? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I don't think we completely understand why. Um, however, I think it may have something to do with the amount of spike um, that's produced by the mRNA vaccine versus maybe what's delivered in the others. Um, Sinovac is a different type of vaccine. It's an inactivated um, virus. And so there's more of the virus that the immune system sees. So it's maybe not quite as focused on that RBD, which is the part that actually makes the virus infectious. So there may be, you know, this is just a hypothesis. There may be some, we call them distracting epitopes on Sinovac just because it's not as focused of a vaccine, but it still does have uh, some effectiveness. So that's, a, that's my brief answer on that. Thank you so much. I am very sad that we don't have more time for questions. Although if you put them in the chat, I will try to collect them up and we may be able to uh, do a blog post or something addressing some of them perhaps. Uh, but now we are going to split into small groups to sort of workshop how some of the ideas here about 
science as a gift and about collaboration might work out in our various different fields. Mm -hmm.